thanks for uh, thanks for tuning out this afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to pick up on a couple of things uh, Diana mentioned. Uh, for those who saw the previous presentation, she was referring to food that gets transported all over the world. Uh, just to help you guys out, I'm going to take all the New Zealand lamb and apples home with me. So we'll do a bit of a, a collection. Uh, and I'll just relieve you of that. And we might give you James Cameron back because he's now a New Zealand resident and he's pushing a whole vegan agenda down in New Zealand. So <laughs> you can have that one back. Uh, I'm going to cover the uh, developmental origins of health and disease, uh, which is a topic uh, that I'm starting to see a little bit more of uh, to poke its head up. Uh, I know Tim in his presentation this morning did touch on it a little bit. I'm going to give a very high level overview uh, despite degrees and stuff. I know nothing in a depth, so don't ask me anything in a depth, but I'll kind of skim over the surface and that might be enough for people to dive down a rabbit hole from there. Let's go. All right, so uh, common theme to this, uh, this symposium is that we've got this whole thing called mismatch going on, uh, and it's sort of getting largely agreed, even outside of this little bubble of ancestral health that, uh, that we live in, it's getting largely agreed um, that this mismatch is at the core of many of the chronic diseases which seem to kind of define the uh, modern human state. Uh, by the way, if anyone's struggling with the accent, subtitles are up there for most of it, that's, uh, that's the important bit. Uh, while it's not uncommon for people to kind of put forward a, a single theory of everything when we look at uh, the, the problems that we're facing, uh, most people are starting to agree that we've got a bit of a perfect storm going on that's multi it's very complex, it's very multifactorial. Um, and the largest portion is um, sort of starting to sense more and more in the discussions, the largest portion of the problems that we face are environmental. We have a tendency to focus more on the individuals, but as individuals we're largely products of our environment. So many of the uh, factors are external to us. Uh, and just from this diagram here, as I go through my presentation, the, it's probably not uh, particularly clear, but uh, the developmental origins aspects are everything that's kind of highlighted in yellow. Uh, around here, so it does make up a big chunk of uh, perhaps some of these uh, factors that we're thinking are at play with the problems that we face. Um, we've got a, uh, we've, we've set our environment up where it's, it's such that most of us are opted into uh, ill health, and in order to live a better life, to uh, be a healthier human being, we have to opt out of the default environment which we're all landed in. Now that causes problems in that opting out of that environment requires knowledge, it requires uh, resources, uh, both monetary uh, resources and sort of knowing what you're, you're doing. Uh, and we've also got the double, double whammy where that opt out is being sold to those people with extra resources at a premium. So uh, we're seeing this sort of big inequality and this big split across the, the population. Uh, Public health resources, as they are currently at, they're often being directed towards uh, treating acute manifestations of the, the chronic illnesses rather than preventing those diseases in the, the, the first place. And, and you know, this is a fairly well accepted. Uh, what we're starting to see is this, this thing called the, the transgenerational, um, uh, the transgenerational uh, transmission of some of these, these issues, which means that they are skimming across one generation to the next. They're not isolated to one particular group and they're being in, inherited as so well. Uh, develop a little bit more as we go through this. But we, we're not directing any of the public health resources towards preventing that transmission. We're still, we're still largely of a model uh, that is focused on the here and now and in particular um, towards individuals who are probably have the most influence, uh, particularly at a political level. Uh, so we can see that um, historically we've, we've waited until adults develop some sort of uh, acute manifestation of some sort of chronic uh, ill health before intervening. So uh, right at the very sort of top here. So basically at the point that you, s historically, as you've suffered a heart attack, well, we might sort of intervene uh, in uh, some sort of intervention there, or you've, you've been diagnosed with cancer, uh, we, we un undertake some sort of intervention. But uh, that's comes at a very, very high cost, both in terms of uh, finances, but uh, obviously for the individuals going through some of these uh, treatments at, at that point. And it will have a very limited impact in terms of uh, both the lifespan and health span for, for that, uh, that particular individual. Uh, but more recently, we've, attended, we've attempted to head off some of the disease development through screening of adults, particularly in their uh, middle years. Um, and so, so round about here, we might uh, undertake a, a national screening program again, particularly for some of the cancers around, trying to kind of head off 
uh, some of the, the development of these uh, diseases, but in the end, they inevitably end up just being sort of uh, not much more than uh, a delay tactic more than anything else, and again, probably have fairly limited impact uh, overall. Um, and often these, uh, uh, these screening programs chase fairly dubious biomarkers at, at best, so th they're kind of questionable in terms of their overall uh, impact. And they may be, or well, not maybe, they're certainly too late in terms of making an impact on any sort of transgenerational transmission of these chronic diseases, because typically at sort of this age here where these screening programs kick in, people have already had their children, so uh, any sort of an inheritable uh, features have already been passed on to the next generation. Uh, the developmental origins of health and disease uh, hypothesis or, or paradigm very much sort of focuses on this bottom line through here, where if we get the timing right and we focus on the, the right aspects, uh, then you know, we can set individuals and societies on a much lower risk trajectory overall. Uh, and recognising that much of our health and disease is developmental in origin, uh, society may need to move away from investing its biggest chunk of its health resources into late ad adulthood interventions and shift them over to the other end of the life cycle, particularly focusing on infants, children and adolescents and probably through to young adults uh, in their very uh, early reproductive years. Uh, and there's a, an increasing call for the first thousand days of life, which is a period uh, basically periconceptually from conception through to about two years of age. And that seems to be one of uh, the critical intervention points, if not you know, the most critical one, for altering the chronic disease trajectory that we are witnessing globally. So you can see that's a, that's a big paradigm shift to go from screening people in their 40s and 50s through to investing the largest chunk of our public health dollar down uh, in uh, the very young. Uh, the early work in this area, uh, in the terms of the development of this hypothesis, came uh, via Professor David Barker uh, from Population Ob observations made in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and Barker's hypothesis was based on, uh, based on these observations, stated that if uh, a nutritional environment in which a pregnant woman lives is constrained, then the woman will program her developing fetus for a thrift, what we call a thrifty phenotype. Uh, so, and if the infant uh, then encounters a world which isn't nu nutritionally uh, constrained, its own metabolic settings become mismatched to that environment and susceptibility to the range of later life diseases increases. So this is sort of you know, potentially where we're at currently where uh, by virtue of several mechanisms which I'll, I'll outline very shortly, uh, we've got this sort of postnatal overnutrition uh, at play for infants that were probably programmed for this thrifty phenotype. Uh, so alongside genetic and cultural inheritances, it is also becoming understood that there's also environmental inheritances uh, mediated maternally and paternally, and I, I know there tends to be a lot of focus on the mother, um, but there needs to be as much focus on the, the father in, uh, in this development as well. Um, and through this of uh, mediated maternally and uh, paternal inheritance, uh, environmental exposures from one generation can condition the phenotype uh, of the next and possibly, probably most likely subsequent generations. And this is where that, that whole sort of nature-nurture uh, interaction uh, occurs. Um, the environmental exposures of the mother and father can influence the epigenome of the ovum, ovum and sperm, and while, uh, while more acute environmental exposures experienced by the mother during pregnancy can obviously influence the in utero embryonic uh, epigenome. Uh, and here the, the genotypes, so the, the, the base genetics of the developing child remain the same, but it's the phenotypic expression uh, may be altered by the environmental exposures of the, the parents and, again, probably most likely grandparents and great-grandparents. So you've, you've got sort of up to, potentially up to three generations worth of environmental information sitting in uh, each particular uh, generation that comes through. And this ability to developmentally shift your physiological form or the, the infant's physiological forms to suit the particular predicted environment is referred to as de developmental plasticity. And that developmental plasticity allows for a process of adaptation to environments operating between longer term natural selection of the species and then the more immediate homeostasis uh, within, the, within the individual. To give you uh, an illustrative uh, non-human example of this uh, developmental plasticity, we look at a species of uh, desert locust which can cha change the morph of her young based on the population density of other locusts around her uh, and the stress response that this elicits within her. So if the population density is low, uh, her stress levels will be low and she'll produce a flightless offspring which will live in a short range, 
but if the population density is high, her stress levels will be high and she can change the morph of her young to a migratory type, which is enabled with long distance flight and the ability to travel over a much larger range. So you can imagine low population, plenty of resources available, um, doesn't make sense to, to disappear off. Uh, and uh, so that's the morph that she's able to develop. But if there's a very high population density, she's competing for her own resources, her cortisol levels or um, equivalent are, are very high, she's very stressed, so she's programming her young to take flight and to potentially go and seek out uh, a, a better resourced area. Um, so that's the, that's the ability to morph or have that plasticity. Uh, so, in essence, an assessment of the world in which uh, an infant is being born into is signalled both maternally and paternally with the aim of inducing its development in a direction that is matched to that assessment. If the developmental environment is secure, then an investment can be made towards a larger lean body mass and longevity uh, in the developing in, uh, fetus. But, however, if the developmental environment is signalled as being threatening, then trade-offs have to be made in order to ensure the best chances of survival into reproductive years. Uh, and this will be uh, um, adaptations such as a higher fat mass, early puberty, and altered behaviours and stress responses. So it becomes very interesting when you look at uh, this secure developmental environment and, and what that means is basically you get programmed to play a long game. So you can kind of relax, chill out, you can build up your tissue reserve, build up your muscle mass, uh, and you've got a lot of time to play with based on the, the environmental programming that you've received. However, if you're being, being programmed or conditioned towards uh, a more threatening environment, you're not there for the long term, uh, and so you have a, a series of physiological adjustments, and these are very highly integrated adjustments, uh, and you know, we're seeing decreases in, in, in muscle mass, so we're seeing some very low uh, muscle mass and tissue reserve levels in these developing uh, infants. Uh, we're seeing, you know, in particularly in Western worlds, we're seeing this uh, early puberty come through, and there's, there's many theories for this, but um, perhaps this sort of uh, developmental response is one of those. So um, currently, we would argue that uh, you know, despite all the features of a Western world, we're still sort of, uh, very much programming our children for a threatening environment. So within this uh, Doha concept, there are adaptive mechanisms operating within the normal range of developmental exposures, and then there are those as associated with evolutionary novelty that are more likely to be non-adaptive and developmentally disruptive. Uh, and by way of example, I'll be focusing on uh, overnutrition as a disrupting process, uh, but sort of looking at that in conjunction with uh, uh, undernutrition, which is more an adaptive process that uh, we, we can respond to. So if we take uh, maternal undernutrition as an example of an environmental challenge that can drive adaptive processes, the range of uterine signals will, uh, range of uterine signals will occur in response to this challenge, affecting the structure and function of the developing child. Uh, this undernutrition state is signaled when maternal amino acid and micronutrient intake is low, uh, as will be the case on eating a protein dilute, highly um, processed Western diet. Um, and you get this highly integrated multi-system adaptations occur, which includes a decrease in muscle mass uh, and mitochondrial mass, making muscle less metabolically expensive, uh, as, also, as well as uh, behavioural changes such as reduced desire to be active, which is the sort of gluttony and sloth type um, uh, problem that uh, we, we seem to be playing out, but you know, obviously we, we don't think it's those, uh, those issues. Uh, concurrent to maternal undernutrition, we can also have maternal overnutrition with respect to very large supply of carbohydrate being delivered uh, by those very same uh, processed foods that we're exposed to. Um, it gets very interesting because there are constraint mechanisms uh, which exist to limit the supply of amino acids and fatty acids crossing the pl placenta, uh, but th there are no constraint mechanisms for glucose. Uh, and the, the papers that I was reviewing and putting this together, the suggestion was that um, this exposure to high maternal glucose has not been a, a common feature of human evolution, therefore there's no uh, mechanism to slow the influx of, of glucose through to the, the fetus. So we can have uh, two distinct kinds of mismatch operating concurrently with respect to this developmental uh, conditioning linked to one singular aspect within the environment which we, we have, which in, in this case is this highly processed Western diet. So uh, by virtue of their own either uh, maladaptive or disrupting pathways, we end up with virtually the, the same, uh, same result, which is a, some sort of mismatch uh, to the environment in, in which we're born into. Uh, if we take everything into account, we can map quite a, a negative developmental cycle that our society finds themselves um, unwittingly trapped into. 
uh, we, we're seeing children born into very poor developmental environments and they become at increased risk of becoming uh, adolescents and young adults who in their reproductive years unknowingly end up continuing this downward cycle um, of developmental conditioning. Uh, so you can kind of see it, it's, a, it's not a nice cycle that we find a good portion of all of our societies in, and I don't think there's very many Western countries at least who are not, uh, not touched by this developmental cycle. Uh, you can perhaps look at that uh, cycle that we've got sitting up there on the, the graphic and um, you can see probably if you were going to direct your uh, public health dollars at which point you're probably most likely to, to do it and it's certainly not going to be um, after pregnancy as, as tends to currently happen. Uh, for every iteration of this negative cycle, each subsequent generation is set on a trajectory of lower tolerances to the key environmental mismatches we face and higher disease risks um, occurring much earlier in their lives. So this is kind of what we're, we're seeing play out before us where um, it seems every, every generation after the, the previous one seems to be getting hit just a little bit earlier and perhaps a little bit harder uh, with some of the key um, health issues that, uh, that we face in our societies. Uh, and there is definitely an increase in concern that um, if we look at specifics like uh, diabetes, that uh, diabetes can be transmitted across um, generations uh, via that mechanism. So um, again, we've got to look at ways of how we're going to break this cycle. Uh, there, are some, uh, there is some work being done in terms of how to turn this around, and, and again, we come back to this first, uh, first thousand days. So within this first thousand day window, there's an opportunity um, to condition the health of uh, individuals across their, their lifespan. So instead of having each generation kind of get a little bit worse, we, we need to reverse it and have each generation get a little bit better, uh, which means that kind of the environments that we're setting for ourselves in the here and now are not going to be set for largely the benefit of us. They're going to be you know, for the benefit of two, three generations down the track. And unfortunately, humans aren't particularly good at thinking that way. But... Um, this, this period, this first thousand days, is the period with the greatest plasticity, uh, which is that ability to morph and adapt in a matched way, um, and it has the least accumulated exposure to a disrupted environment. So again, if we look at uh, many of the, the modern uh, public health screening processes, they all kind of sit down this, uh, this end of the scale, where your ability to probably turn the ship around is pretty limited, and you've got such a, an accumulated uh, environmental exposure that you're really going to get limited traction with, with some of those uh, um, strategies. So based on the evidence accumulating within this DOHAD concept, um, you can see the futility um, of, of messing around with the population at this end, trying to you know, create a, a healthy population. It really needs to be directed towards the, uh, the other end of the scale. Uh, one of the, the strategies put forward is that we need to develop a greater level of empowerment and self-efficacy um, in terms of uh, health literacy, to uh, teaching ch health literacy to children and, and adolescents. Uh, we need to develop these young uh, individuals uh, to have a greater understanding of their own bodies, uh, their own biology, and the modern environmental exposures and lifestyles that, uh, that can uh, impact on those. We already do it to a certain extent with, with older adults, and, and certainly when you get to a point in life where people start to talk to you about healthy ageing, uh, we, we start to educate older adults in terms of their health literacy and, and what it means in terms of healthy ageing. We actually need to do that better uh, at the other end of the, the scale. Um, and this needs to go beyond just giving adolescents uh, better education around uh, drugs and alcohol and uh, sexually transmitted diseases, but actually give them more uh, empowerment around teaching them about the environment, what those environmental exposures mean, uh, what it will mean for their health, but also the, the health of their um, children uh, that they may potentially want to have. Um, but to do that, we're actually going to need a, a societal shift, which means that we start to place um, a much greater value on 16-year-old um, girls in our societies than what we do with 60-year-old men. Um, you know, we can kind of uh, have a discussion as to, to why we, we have that value system in place currently, but um, ge generally we, we value uh, the older, uh, older part of our society than the, the younger one when it comes to health. Uh, the biggest advantage of this concept uh, is it creates an integrative, uh, integrated and kind of coherent public health policy around it, um, as well as help kind of shift that public mindset allowing the minimization of uh, common disruptive developmental environments that we all face. In one way or another, we're all gonna, we're, we will all have to eventually face up to, uh, whether it be sort of health or, or economically. Um, by linking social inequality issues to both biological outcomes that have developmental origins, researchers, policymakers, community uh, members and parents and, and you know, 
the the influences such as we have in the, the room currently uh, are going to be in a stronger position to argue that the total quality of our societies and lives uh, matter and that inequality is much more than just a, a condition of social economics. Um, so that's uh, that's a, the nuts and bolts of uh, my talk around this. As, as I said, I was only going to sort of deliver it across a, a very kind of high level um, high level skim. What I will flick through to now, and this is me being a little bit cheeky, um, is uh, an advertisement. And uh, Tim already sort of uh, slotted this in right at the, the start uh, to say that uh, we have got our own ancestral health society uh, down in New Zealand. We did uh, run a very successful uh, international symposium last year, which many uh, people from this uh, current symposium came along to. Uh, it is in the gorgeous Queenstown, which you can see up in the photo there. Not too dissimilar, I guess, from uh, where we're at in Boulder, except we've got large amounts of water uh, floating around, uh, as Boulder probably uh, doesn't. Uh, so everyone would be welcome to attend uh, and come down. And we're just uh, we're doing a little bit of a sneaky recruit for speakers uh, as well. So those who are speaking across the rest of this event, um, bring your A game, and you might get an invite to uh, New Zealand. Um, and, and by the way, when I say that, the standard's pretty low because Tim's already in. So, um, uh, I'm pretty much done. So I'll, I'll feel, field any questions if there are then. any. <laughs> Clearly, no one's understood a word. So that's okay. Here we got one. Are you familiar with the Dutch hunger winter and how it um, sort of laid the foundation for Barker uh, verifying his results? Yeah, uh, yes. C well, could you talk a little bit about it? I'm just, I'm going to be talking about it tomorrow, and you set me up beautifully. That was a great talk, by the way. May need oh. you to develop a, a, a little bit more, but the, uh, <coughs> my understanding was that. Uh, uh, as, as we sort of studied uh, different populations uh, around the world who kind of uh, un underwent uh, some of the famines, uh, various famines around there, that we could see that even uh, those who were exposed to some of the famine conditions, but uh, as, as developing, uh, developing children, uh, once they were back in part of a society that had uh, plentiful, uh, uh, plentiful food and other resources and even were uh, transposed into very sort of wealthy family, so they, they kind of ticked all of the boxes in terms of what we think a, a human needs to be healthy, they still carried forth many of the um, many of the illnesses that they were probably preconditioned for as part of that exposure to the, the famine at those sort of critical uh, developmental points. So um, so it kind of, it, it underscores the, the fact that during these very critical developmental phases, that is the, the point at which we need to make sure that the environment is, is pretty solid because even once you get a, a good solid supporting environment outside of those times you end up having very very limited impact in terms of the the disease risk and trajectory that those people end up on so oh no this scares me a little bit oh, oh time for one more question yeah. <laughs> that, that was a terrific talk Thanks, um, i i just want to sort of second everything that you said but um, specifically for our U.S. audience here, everything that he's saying, the dietary guidelines folks um, and the folks at Health and Human Services and USDA are already thinking along these lines. However, they're thinking with their nutritional paradigm in mind. So we have the dietary guidelines for people um, age two and up. Now they're turning their sites to zero and 24. There's a zero to 24 program. The thousand days will be next. Mm. They want to start looking at epigenetic effects and these developmental origins of um, adult diseases. But what they'll be doing is restricting calories and restricting protein. Mm. The two things that we know set the um, child up for metabolic diseases and especially limiting high quality protein. That is as bad, that, that, that causes um, adult metabolic outcomes that are as bad as simply having calories restricted. So um, y the, the stuff that you were saying at the very beginning of the talk about this is a social issue. This is, you can't just sit back and go, I personally can opt out. Your children are going to be marrying people <laughs> and having children with people who haven't opted out. So um, thank you for a terrific talk. Thanks, Adele. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. We've, um, 
one of the the lead researchers in this area, P uh, Sir Peter Gluckman, is uh, actually the chief science advisor to the government that we have in New Zealand. So we're actually starting to see a program of investment in this area. So we're uh, sort of talked about at the start of, uh, and, and they're not as as blatant in, in terms of stating this, but a, a, a disinvestment from that later portion of life and actually reinvesting. Um, at some of these earlier childhood uh, services, supporting mothers, supporting um, uh, supporting infants. However, as Adele points out, despite first-hand knowledge feeding policy in our country, it is still hooked up to very poor dietary guidelines. So there's this big mismatch between the information that the, the government is getting from one of the, the, the leaders of this sort of research and still where we're directing the public to, to live and uh, to, to eat and, and how to live and so on. So uh, we're not going to turn the ship around anytime soon. The other aspect to that, which we'll find uh, very interesting, Adele, is that uh, as soon as you start having this discussion at a, pub a public health level, and it's, it's flared up a couple of times in New Zealand, and I think it has flared up uh, in South America as well, that it often gets positioned as blaming mothers so it's it becomes an issue of mothers are doing the wrong things by their children or or uh, young girls are doing the wrong things when they're going to be the ones having the the babies and we re really need to remove the stigma from from it being a mistake mothers have made and we need to be very calculated with our language so that as this stuff gets to gets more traction and gets rolled out we don't get this public pushback of going right well great now you're blaming mother mothers for everything that's going on in our society well, just not to jump on mothers again. Um, in addition to protein and calories as being energy and growth substrates that can be limiting in utero, that can have a dough head effect. Oxygen is considered a nutrient. Most people don't see it that way. It's a respiratory nutrient. Um, and if it's limited l during uh, gestation, there's a new disease called gestational apnea which projects to the fetus that you're about to be born on top of a mountain. Um, and again, I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow, but there's, there are other substrates other than energy and growth substrates, um, but oxygen can, can also, through if a mom smokes, mm. if a mom you know snores, has apnea, that, that can impact uh, the same way as the energy mm. substrates. There's, there's, there's a lot of developmental disruptors out there. Uh, I only touched on the nutritional side of things more for for timing in fact i'm a nutritionist so that's where my bias is but uh there's anything from uh, as i say oxygen availability microbiome seasonal um seasonal aspects sun exposure um uh, illness exposure during pregnancy skeletal muscle mass that was that was probably my next presentation if i do one but the skeletal muscle mass of the of the mother is a developmental uh, has a developmental aspect as well. So there, there's loads of, of aspects out there, but they all kind of circle back around to this highly mismatched environment that we have, so. One more. Hello. Um, Hello. I wanted to ask you if there was any, um, if any connection to maternal effect genes in these epigenetic changes experienced? You're asking the wrong guy. You want to talk genetics, talk to, talk to this guy <laughs> down here, but. No, genetics is outside of my, my scope, so I wouldn't be able to answer, sorry. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Oh, oh, one more. No, 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 you go. You go. No, I time. had a question about um, the New Zealand health system. Do you have what we have, uh, have over here, like a kind of like a cartelized, like the American Medical Association? <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> like, like what, yeah. can, can you just treat somebody, like when you're a nutritionist, yes. do you have a, like a, state license and is that necessary and do you have to teach certain things can you get in trouble for recommending like uh, a high cholesterol diet on, on the nutrition side of things we have and, and probably very similar to to what you have here uh we've got registered dietitians and they walk a pretty narrow line uh and you know they've got certain expectations in terms of their, their scope of practice and the information they're, they're, they're giving a, across uh you can be a registered nutrition uh, nutri nutritionist in new zealand but uh, again, probably similar to what you have here, you can be also be an un unregistered one. Uh, I was a registered nutritionist for a, a while. I got nothing out of giving someone some money, so I deregistered. So, but and so there's there's no limits on my scope of practice. I don't get I don't get hauled before a board if I step outside of the limit. So I, I've I've got a lot of freedom that, in that respect. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs>